Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, the Red Balloon Theatre Company. I did ask just before someone, uh, what's the best thing about Steve Gork Roger? They said that he's married to Janet Gork Roger. And uh, it was actually Janet I'd asked, actually. And, uh, <laughs> but I agree with her and uh, so do many others. So Janet, very warm welcome to you. And Steve, a very warm welcome. Steve's our preacher this evening. He needs very little introduction to most of us. A very regular speaker from this platform, speaking at Spring Harvest and UCCF and the Keswick Convention. He'll be there this summer, giving the Bible readings in week two. Steve is the senior pastor of a Gold Hill Baptist Church and speaks very regularly at conferences and conventions like this all around the world. The author of a book or 12, and uh, we're delighted that Steve's here this evening. Steve, do join me, and let's give him a warm welcome. Steve, we're gonna pray, we're gonna pray for you and uh, pray for ourselves as we hear God's word read and explained. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for those days and times that you've thrilled us with your word. Thank you for Steve and for the many gifts that you've given to him, the way that you've used him to expound your word and to challenge your people. And we pray again that you'll be with him, anoint him, and give us all ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us as individuals, to our churches, to our nation. We pray that we may leave here this evening, changed by your word, through your spirit, and that you'll find in our hearts a response of joy and obedience. Be with us now, we pray. Help us, not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good evening. Great to be here at Spring Harvest Word Alive. Glad to be with you thinking about such important themes. I believe that you've been looking at uh, Daniel um, in the morning and uh, here in the evening looking at the Acts of the Apostles. And our theme tonight about being behind enemy lines is thinking about how we can make our faith work in a hostile climate and for us to reflect on uh, that school that place of work, that home, that street, and say to ourselves, in that world where people seem to either mock my faith or more likely are just plain bored with any talk of Christianity, what lessons do the Acts of the Apostles have for us as we live out our faith in that world that seems from time to time antagonistic to what we say about Jesus, and if not that, then disregarding of who he claims to be. So it's an enormous challenge tonight. And I'd like to say four things from this passage, which we'll read together in a moment, about living out our faith and the requirements which the New Testament speaks of to make a dramatic, significant and permanent impact in the world in which God has placed us. But firstly, I think we need some perspective on the hostile world in which many of us think we live. I could not have asked for better drama than that which you have just seen. I didn't speak to them about my introduction. I, I had no clue what the drama was going to be, be about until it happened, but it brilliantly illustrates the comparison between suffering and hostility which many Christians undergo worldwide and that which we have to endure in our lives, wherever that might be. And we must get some perspective. Because in the four things I'm going to say tonight, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Firstly, to pray that God will enable you to live that out wherever you are. But secondly, to bear in mind that all around the world, there are women and men tonight who live in a genuinely hostile environment. They are being persecuted for their faith right now. Not the broken nail. Bad hair day, nothing on the telly kind of persecution. But the prison. Torture. Abandonment kind 
of persecution. So I'm pleading with us tonight to get a sense of perspective so that what we learn, we apply to ourselves and we also pray for our sisters and brothers around the planet who are suffering for their faith. And they're doing that tonight in Saudi Arabia, in North Korea, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Bhutan, in country after country where there simply is hostility, the like of which most of us have never experienced. So I'm really, I'm pleading with you, get a grip tonight on your, on your horizon. Get a perspective on your uh, suffering. I, I came across recently a, a lovely uh, letter which uh, helped me with the question of perspective. I read it to you before I read the scripture just to set our suffering in, a, in an appropriate context. There was a, a young mum of uh, a teenage daughter and uh, passing her bedroom on one occasion, noticed it was rather untidy. A surprise. <laughs> and making her way into her room, she noticed that, rather strangely, the bed had been made, and on it was an envelope addressed to her mother. Her mother, thinking this strange, fumbles with the envelope and opens it, and inside she finds a letter from Judith, her daughter. Dear Mum, it is with great regret and sorrow that I am writing to you. I have had to elope with my new boyfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with Dad and you. I'm finding a real passion with John. He's ever so nice, even with all his piercings, tattoos, beard and motorcycle clothes. It's not only a passing passion, Mum. I'm expecting his baby, and John says we'll be very happy in his trailer in the woods. <laughs> he wants me to have many more children with him, and that's one of my dreams too now. John has even taught me that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone, <laughs> and we're going to be growing it and trading it. In the meantime, we're going to pray that science will find a cure for John's AIDS. Don't worry, Mum. I'm 15 years old now and I know how to take care of myself and someday we'll be back to visit so that you can get to know your grandchildren. Your loving daughter, Judith. P.S. Mum, none of the above is true. I'm over at a neighbour's house. I just wanted you to know that there are worse things in life than my report card. <laughs> which is in my desk drawer. <laughs> I love you. Call when it is safe for me to come home. <laughs> Perspective is everything. And so I long for us tonight to get a grip of our lives and get some perspective. And that while it may be true that we do live in a world where it is very difficult indeed to make a convincing case for Christianity to our husband or our wife who does not yet believe or to our rebellious adolescent teenager who seems to have abandoned any show or pretense of even coming to church, never mind believing what we believe. Or colleagues at work or neighbours in the street whose lives seem happy and fulfilled and broadly content, and where's God in it? Nowhere. And when we have the temerity to raise him in conversation, we're greeted either with blank looks of incomprehension, only occasionally downright hostility, and never, in Britain today, the kind of suffering in some of those countries I've mentioned. So, Please be aware of those things. Be praying for us as we engage this message. And pray too for a world in pain beyond the borders, not just of this tent, not just of this county, but beyond the borders of this nation around the world. Well, our reading is in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. 
And may I encourage you either to turn in your Bibles to Acts 19, as I read, or to look on the screen. Because the words of this passage, at least the first 20 verses, will appear there. And I'm going to read it to you, if I may. And briefly, from time to time, pause and comment on it over the next two or three minutes. And then make what I hope will be four very simple points, which I believe are true here in God's word and are true today as we live out this Christian faith. So here we are, Acts chapter 19, beginning to read at verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, he'd actually been in Ephesus and, and then gone on to Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior, literally cross-country, and arrived in Ephesus. This is the scene for our deliberations this evening. Ephesus, a population possibly 200,000 strong, uh, an, an enormously significant city, a Roman assized town where cases were judged, cosmopolitan, people from all over the world, a trading town, a town, as we'll see in a few moments, where there was Diana or Artemis worship, uh, temple prostitution was rife, uh, sports were very common, a huge arena that seated 25,000 people in the centre of Ephesus. A huge temple to Diana, 127 gloriously embossed pillars to a goddess, which was actually some kind of stone that appears to have fallen from the sky. So this is a cosmopolitan city, not unlike many of the places we live today, rife with different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, the centre of a judicial uh, court, thriving with people of different races and different backgrounds. And it's into that world that Paul arrives back. Been there for a brief visit previously, but this is going to turn into something longer. There he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. Now, I just want to say this now in the introduction rather than when I come to it. This passage used to be, for some, a kind of touchstone of orthodoxy, depending on how you interpreted it. They're, they're waiting on the platform there with bated breath <laughs> to see if I'm going to be sound <laughs> on this passage. Hands up if you think I'm going to be sound in the next few minutes. Okay. Any, any, anybody got any confidence? <laughs> no. Okay. This passage has been used over many years to, uh, to support a, a two-stage initiation process to the Christian faith because particularly some of the older translations seem to talk about uh, after uh, this moment, another moment came rather than uh, when they heard about the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, verse 2? Uh, some translations had after you have received. Some people believe that it justified a kind of second baptism experience because uh, Paul baptized them again. There's great confusion that reigns. Can I just uh, say to you uh, that it's probably best not to build an entire doctrine on this passage. So... Probably that's a wise sort of word. And try not to judge people who talk about this passage um, on the superficial way they, they deal with it in terms of whether or not they're sound. We always do that with speakers. I've parachuted into Spring Harvest Word Alive this week. You haven't seen me all week. You're trying to make a judgment, some of you, about whether this preacher tonight is sound or not. Some of you, in the worship time, you looked over just to see those of you with a more charismatic bent Saw my wife raise her hand in worship and you thought, ha, ah, he's one of us. <laughs> Those of you with a less charismatic bent thought, well, he's got a strange wife, but he does have a big Bible. <laughs> so we make all sorts of judgments about soundness on relatively superficial evidence. And in a moment, I'm going to say to you, 
that the kind of theological position that some people have tried to build on this passage is actually very unhelpful. I, I want to try and say to you that some of the straightforward historical stuff of what went on in Paul's actual ministry is going to be more helpful to us than arguing about some of those details which have occupied the minds of theologians over a considerable period. And I'll probably trail my coat just a little bit so you get a hint about the way I think this passage might ought to be understood. But look at verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And, and, and you're absolutely right. If you're sitting there thinking Tyrannus sounds exactly like tyrant, then think back to the worst teacher you ever had in school, nicknamed the tyrant. So the tyrant had his own teaching centre. And when he wasn't teaching, he let Paul use the hall. May, you may not have been such a tyrant. Students aren't always right, by the way. If you're a teacher here, don't feel threatened by that. <laughs> this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And then two interesting verses. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even his handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Folks, there are some things in the Bible that I just somehow wish Luke had glossed over a bit. <laughs> because they're so tricky to understand, aren't they? It's outside our realm of normal experience. Very few of us have got the healing ministry of the tissue. <laughs> it, 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 what do we make of all this? I just want to say to you, we'll come back to it, but I just want to say to you that there are times when the best of us along with the worst find aspects of biblical teaching difficult and frustrating. And I would say to you that the longer I spend teaching the Bible, studying it for myself, the more I have come to understand that the only appropriate approach to all of Scripture is to sit humbly at its feet and acknowledge its authority, even when I can, can't understand it. And to let it sit in judgment over me, and not me with my mere human mind sit in judgment over it. So Luke records this. He does call them extraordinary miracles. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, these were travelling exorcists, which weren't uncommon at this period of history, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, it's a bit tricky. There isn't a, a reference in secular history anywhere to a, a chap called Sceva who was ever the high priest. And it, it looks like this is a more general reference to simply one of the Jewish uh, leaders. And the, the phrase chief priest is used in a rather more general sense rather than the specific sense of the Gospels where the word high priest is used to mean a specific individual. One day, verse 15, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who on earth are you? Isn't it great? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that, that there's, it's really great. There's a, the religious leaders are trying to cast out the demons. It is a wonderful example that the demons know more than religious teachers. <laughs> just, just think about that for a moment. Jesus I know, Paul I know, the demonic power says, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating, they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, so you get a hint there of the kind of multiracial, multireligious culture of Ephesus, Jews and Greeks, they were all, across the cultural barriers and religious divides, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high 
honour. This, the phraseology of Luke here seems an almost deliberate echo of what happened after Ananias and Sapphira had been struck dead by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember the phrase that follows that in the Acts of the Apostles? And people were petrified. They were too afraid to join the church. Folks, just say this. It's not in the, it's not in the passage. I just, wanna, just want to say that it will be a thrilling thing on the day our local churches were so evidentially filled with God's power, people were afraid. I mean, that would be a fantastic moment. It would mean that we were not just excellent at teaching things, that our social action programs were wonderful. These things are vital, but that somehow the, the presence of the living God was so obvious that there was fear. If you asked me what I thought part of the problem of our culture was, I would say that we are completely lacking in a fear of the Lord. And because of that absence... We do not see the reverence towards God and his laws, his church, his values that we would long to see. So they were terrified. Absolutely terrified. The name of Jesus was held in high honor. Verse 18. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma, sil silver coins, possibly as much as a day's wage. So 50,000 workmen's day's wages. I mean, it's an incredible sum. An act of massive repentance on behalf of many who'd been sucked into an occultic, superstitious, religiously deviant lifestyle. And then verse 20, the final verse, in this way, and this is our prayer tonight, isn't it? This is our dream. This is what we want in our world, which rejects the gospel. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. This is God's holy and inspired word. Well, what are these, for these four things that uh, I believe need to characterise the church of Jesus today, need to characterise my life and yours, and need to characterise the church wherever it finds expression? Well, the first one is this, that there was supernatural, miraculous power demonstrated. So this is the first point that we're looking at tonight in these early verses, verse chapter 19, 1 through verse 7. There was supernatural spiritual encounter. The living God is demonstrated. Now, these people appeared to Paul to be disciples. Now, there are those who believe they were genuinely disciples of Jesus. But if that's true, their faith was deeply defective. I mean way off course, because they had never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And it seems to me much more likely that Paul, searching out as he was, people with links to both the synagogue and, and any Christian community, perhaps linked with the work of Apollos or others, sees in these 12 signs of some kind of teaching. It's clearly, as I say, either on the margins of any kind of real Christian faith, or, as I tend to believe, not Christian faith at all, a pseudo-Christianity, which has stopped short of genuine engagement with Jesus Christ and had only come to the point of knowing that repentance was important, the baptism of John. Because they never heard of the Holy Spirit. And as far as we can tell, throughout the pages of not just the narratives of the Acts, but the, the Pauline and the Petrine, that is Paul and Peter's letters, all of them indicate that there is no genuine faith without the Holy Spirit. It, it isn't possible to follow Jesus and to believe in him without the Holy Spirit's activity. So my take on this, for what it's worth, is that Paul comes across a deeply defective or not even yet Christian bunch of people who are nevertheless hungry for truth and in their hunger they come to him and he not only instructs them, yes there is such a thing of the Holy Spirit and by the way your teaching so far is fine but it's not adequate, he then talks to them about Jesus and they are touched in a mighty way by the Holy Spirit and the verse which concludes this section, verse 6 and 7, says that the Holy Spirit 
came on them. A very dramatic phrase, a very colourful phrase. Uh, and they spoke in tongues, languages they hadn't learned, and they prophesied. Uh, and then if you just uh, flick over to verses 11 and 12, you see other examples of evidential power, extraordinary miracles, handkerchiefs, aprons, sick people, cured, illnesses dealt with, evil spirits evicted. And it seems to me that Paul is making his mark on the Ephesian community by exploits not simply of explanation, which we will come to in a moment because they're vital. But he comes to them to quote Zechariah in the Old Testament, not simply with words and power, but with the Spirit. Not only by might and power, but it's the Spirit of the Lord who needs to be at work. Now, the great danger of this is that we all interpret this through a kind of theological or denominational lens. And so if we have a particular view on the fullness of the Spirit or so on, we tend to read that back into the pages of the Bible. And I am, I am desperate tonight for this passage neither to be embraced nor dismissed at either end of the spectrum by those who hold any view of any kind about the work of the Spirit. But I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, wherever you are from, whatever background, to embrace this reality that the Bible declares that our God is active in his world and that knowing Jesus involves spiritual activity, not simply a dry and academic acknowledgement of certain facts. In this case, not even the full facts. The power of God demonstrated through Paul. Now, I accept fully that Paul was an apostle and that we are not. And that some of the things we see in the Acts of the Apostles seem extremely rare to us today. Part of the reason I believe that is true is because miracles, in my experience, occur on the front line of mission. And when the church is being persecuted, they do not occur in the comfort of our churches. And the reality of the miraculous in our world today... If you want to see it, you go where people are going through agony to follow Jesus and where women and men are sold out to the missionary task. On the frontiers of mission, you still see the miracle. And it's a thrilling thing to see. And it's a reminder of how desperately we need the power of God tonight. Not one of us can go back into our hostile environment, be it the work in the doctor's surgery or the teaching in the school or as the shop assistant or the MD of some multinational company. Not one of us dare go back into the environment that awaits us the following weekend through the Easter period and back to work without the power of God at work in our lives. We must cry to him for a faith which is more than mere mind games but which has been worked out in life. Brothers and sisters, there's a fantastic power available to you as a believer. Do you believe that? The fantastic power available to you and to me. And it's not an it, it's a him. It is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, I, I fly uh, quite a lot, usually by plane. Um, <laughs> I love that story of, uh, of Muhammad Ali in a jet across the Atlantic and turbulent strikes and the, uh, and the stewardess comes and says, uh, Mr. Ali, please do your seatbelt up. And, uh, and he looks at her with some arrogance and says, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she looks at him with a stern look and says, Superman don't need no plane. Do your seatbelt up, please. <laughs> Well, I fly quite a bit, and, and I'm, I have to confess that I'm not the greatest flyer in the world. I mean, I don't enjoy it, to be, to be frank. Well, I, I do it when I have to, and I have to do it rather more than I want to. I'm, people say to me sometimes, Steve, are you frightened of flying? And I say, no, don't be stupid. I'm frightened of not flying. <laughs> You'll get that in a minute, and it'll, it'll all ripple through, and... But what I like doing on planes, even when I'm nervous, I like sitting on aeroplanes and I like watching the way people respond who are obviously nervous. And, and I like looking around and seeing who's comfortable reading the paper, relaxing, and others for whom this is the first time they've flown or the 5,000th time they've flown, but they're still afraid. 
The plane taxis away, usually reversing away from the jetway where you've got on the plane, and makes its way slowly to the edge of the runway and taxis to the edge of the runway and the pilot may come on the loudspeaker system and say, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry for the delay, we are next in line for takeoff. The plane pulls to the end of the runway and the engines roar into life. Many of you have flown, you, you know this. And people who are nervous of flying grip the seat like this and they stare straight ahead. Now, I am not kidding, I've seen this a thousand times. And they stare straight ahead like this. And the plane gets nearer and nearer the point of no return and the nose of the plane just lifts up and then the back wheels lift up and watch the people who are nervous at just that point. What happens is this, as the plane just eases off the ground, they ease out of their seat like this. <laughs> and there's daylight underneath like that. Because what they're doing is they're helping the plane. <laughs> Hands up if you know that's true. <laughs> you nervous flyers, you. What is the point of that? This dirty great plane with hundreds of people and all the luggage that you brought that you needed and all the luggage you brought you didn't need and couldn't possibly need. And the fuel and the weight of the plane and the food you're going to be served and consumed. All that and you're helping. You need help. <laughs> and you see, we, we know that, don't we? we? We just, in the logic of this tent, we know that. But I want to tell you, the next time I get on an aeroplane and it begins to take off, I'm going to feel exactly that again. And my, the tragedy is not people who are afraid to fly. The tragedy is the thousands of Christians I know who somehow live their Christian lives as if the power of God is simply unavailable. They're trying to live their Christian lives and they're going to have just as much success as getting that plane off the ground by their own power. I promise you, it's the aerodynamic shape, it's the power of the engines. I promise you, the Christian life cannot be lived in Ephesus it cannot be lived in London, it cannot be lived in Skegness, it cannot be lived anywhere on planet Earth today except by the power of God. It cannot be lived in any other way. And I've had the opportunity to travel to countries where people are imprisoned for their faith. Some visits of which have been so confidential, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you where I've been. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate to share. And what do they always ask for, wherever they are? They always ask for prayer. I've never been asked for money. I've never been asked for a whole range of things I would ask for if I was in those circumstances. But they, 99 times out of 100, ask for prayer because they say this, we need the power of God more than anything else. Brothers and sisters, I plead with you to deny a powerless Christian faith. Not to seek for the miraculous for its own sake. That would be wholly out of keeping with the New Testament. But to seek God for a life which is empowered by him. And the second thing is not just that Paul demonstrates power in this hostile environment, but he, he then uh, has this kind of persevering, persistent discipleship program going on that seems completely at odds with what I've just said about power. In other words, not only is there this power encounter, there is the persistent discipleship of verses 8, 9 and 10. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months. For 12 or 13 Sabbath days, he goes into the synagogue and engages those Jews with the arguments about who Jesus is and what he came to do and why he's the fulfillment of the law and why he's not antagonistic to Judaism but its fulfillment and how they can trust in him and still be fully Jews by race but be completed Jews and know this Jesus the Saviour and Lord. He argues, remonstrates, preaches... He's desperate to convince them and, and only leaves, verse 9, when some of them become obstinate, refuse to believe, and they mock the way. And he thinks, I'm not going to do this anymore. And so what does he do then? He hires a lecture hall, no doubt in between the tent-making role he has. And for two years, he teaches, disciples, preaches, explains. I want to tell you that there are those who would have you believe 
that in a postmodern world, all you need is experience and that the instruction of the mind doesn't matter. Can I just say to you that that is totally out of keeping with the New Testament and totally out of keeping with all my experience of the way the living God actually operates. The mind and its instruction remains at the centre of biblical understanding. Two years to explain the gospel. Folks, the more postmodern we become, the further we leave a kind of Christendom model of faith, the further away from that our culture moves, the more we will need catechism, discipleship, spiritual teaching, educative uh, planning from the living God, whatever we're going to call this, we need long processes of discipleship because people are starting further and further and further away from where we would understand Christian faith to be. We live in a vastly different world. A world of 1954, which happened to be the year I was born, in 54 and 55, a world-famous evangelist, Billy Graham, came to this country and appealed to thousands to follow Christ, and they did, because broadly they had some kind of residual understanding of biblical truth in some vague form. And they were able to grasp it, live it, and be born again. And it was wonderful. But we do not live in that world today. Vast numbers of people do not know the Bible stories. They do not know the biblical values on which we have based our lives. And so they start way back here. And so the standard apologetics that we so often engage in is wasted sometimes. We're trying to convince the world that Jesus is credible and most of them don't even believe he's plausible. That distinction has failed to be grasped by vast sections of the church today who are shouting arguments to a bunch of deaf ears. There are miles back here, most people. Thank God for the courses, Emmaus, uh, Y course, Alpha, whatever, that give people an extended process to ask questions about Jesus, Jesus Christ. But then what do we do? We then say to them, well, you've done that now and you've become a Christian, that's great. But folks, it's going to take another three or four years of discipleship to get those people really knowing what God's all about, probably. Because they've got so much baggage to get rid of, so many values to unlearn, so many standards to jettison, so many things to embrace that are alien to them. And so if we're going to win this hostile culture for Jesus Christ, the church has to rise up and cry to God for a new anointing of power. And secondly, it has to become engaged seriously, not in seeking merely decisions for Jesus, but longing for godly disciples. We will sell this generation short if we simply acknowledge with a nod and a wink, a signed piece of paper, a hand raised in a meeting, someone kneeling at the front, that's great, that is really wonderful, but it is only the beginning. And Paul understood that and gave this his absolutely fundamental commitment, the teaching of the word over a number of years. So the church should be called to this power encounter. It should be called to persistent Patient discipleship. And thirdly, notice this, not just verses 13 to 16, but indeed throughout the entire uh, passage, you'll notice the centrality of Jesus. Now, I've just noticed that it's, um, it's 25 past 8 and parents will need to be going in, in a moment. If I finish, um, guys, in five minutes, is that okay? Can I take that? Okay, thank you, Peter. All right, five minutes. I just want to show you that I am a man under authority. Uh... <laughs> Jesus is central to this process, and I believe that's true in this hostile environment in which we find ourselves. Jesus is central to this passage. Verse 4. He told them about the coming after him, one, following John, who is Jesus. Verse 5. They're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse uh, um, 13 and 14. The demon-possessed were cast out in the name of of Jesus, verse 17, and it was in the name of Jesus that was held in high honour. In the end, in our culture, we need power encounter, yes, persistent discipleship, yes, thirdly, we need to make Jesus central, as he was central in the ministry of Paul, central in the ministry of Peter, central in the writings of the New Testament, and obviously the dominant character of the gospel narratives. Jesus must be elevated among us again. Not simply as a name, but we have to rescue Jesus from being merely a casual blasphemy. 
to being a name we love, a name we adore, a name that we treasure, a name that we worship, a name that we are obsessed with. And not simply emotionally, but mentally. And in every way, looking at Jesus and presenting him to our world. Many people who are fed up with the church, turned off by its institutional life, terribly disappointed by the hypocrisy of its members, that's you and me, are still incredibly attracted to the magnetic person who is Jesus Christ. There's an amazing affinity still about Jesus. I can talk to people hard-nosed, hard-bitten, negative about Christian faith. I tell you this, time and time again, they are willing to engage with the person of Jesus Christ. And fourthly, and finally, there has to be in our culture genuine repentance. This is verse 17 following. They bring all these scrolls together. What are these things? They're kind of artifacts of occult involvement. They may even have been uh, sacred documents relating to the worship of Diana, who, as we heard earlier, was a really big feature of the Ephesian area. We're not entirely sure what they were. And in one sense, you might say, well, they weren't really very important. What's a piece of paper? Surely it's what happens inside that really counts. Well, of course, it is what happens inside that really counts. But Luke records this incident for a number of reasons, one of which is this, to demonstrate that these folks' repentance was real. And they were turning their back on yesterday and saying hello to tomorrow. They were not content merely to nod in the direction of Paul's teaching. They were not content merely to say, yes, Paul, you're right, okay, fine, we repent. As if using the word was the same as the reality. They repented in their hearts and demonstrated it by the, one of the largest bonfires Ephesus had ever seen. And what was it a token of? It was a token that these people meant business with God. They were not prepared for some emotional sop which said, oh, you have had some feeling about God. Repentance meant a change of heart and a change of attitude and a change of direction. And whenever we soft pedal this in people's lives because we don't want to offend them as they come to Jesus, we're ruining them because they'll be half converted and it will do them no good and the church no good and us no good. So I appeal to you to go back to your churches, to cry again that God will enable us to be genuinely repentant, not the half-hearted Christians we so easily are, and say, God, I'm serious. Anything you say, I'll put on the altar and burn it and get rid of it if it's stopping me follow you. And let's go back to our churches and let's be excited again about what God can do with us in our hostile environments. Let's cry to him for a move of God in our lives. Let's persist in training and developing and discipling. Let's keep Jesus central in all we do and make this attractive Son of God attractive to a desperately hungry world. And let's not let people get away with mere assent. Let's model repentance by giving our all to God and let's demand repentance in those in our world that we speak of that they're being called to a mission, being called to a passion, being called to a whole new life. Then together, the church of Jesus Christ will rise up and make an unbelievable impact in a hostile community. God bless you.